So poetry yeah. again. We do have the Griffin Prize, and I'm really glad that we do. And you know, I tell any acting student I work with, I say you got to learn a poem every two weeks. You have to learn a poem, yeah. and you have to repeat it over and over again. You have to learn a poem. Oh, I don't want to learn a poem. I have my TV sides. I got to do a. You learn a poem because there's something in the structure of language, the use of everything you talked about, that for a young acting student, it get, it's the gymnasium. <laughs> it's the intellectual, emotional, physical gymnasium to explore language in that poetry. But, I'm sorry, would you ever say to, you know, your ambition, be a poet. You will never work. Oh, yeah, you will never be paid. No. So, so the question is, how do we restore a very potent use of language and essential use of language to some place of essentialness in our culture. Uh, you see, okay, I'm, I'm probably the, the wrong person to be asking this question because I do not believe that poetry is marginalized in any way, shape, or form. Uh, in terms of I'll stop of, by the poetry store on the way back to the TCC. I'll go and shop for some poetry. No, of course not. No, I agree. I agree. Although, um, but that's not where you necessarily are going to find poetry. Uh, I believe you find poetry wherever anyone has something uh, emotional to express that they have no other words for. And then what happens in that moment is an organic, spontaneous outpouring of meaningful language in compact form that may also be very picturesque and memorable and emotive as, as hell. Now, that kind of language can take any form because it is immediate and spontaneous and organic to that instance and so on. But nevertheless, it may still be live poetry because ultimately poetry is language charged with great energy and power uh, and so on that can only at the same time that energy and power can only be accessed if it is spoken aloud. You can't get the second coming, Yeats' second coming, sitting there with your scotch or Irish whiskey, whatever, sitting there, and you got a cigar going on over here, and you say, turning and turning in the widening gyre, puff, right, or sip. You can't do that. That's not how you read that poem. You got to read that poem with a sense of apocalypse. The apocalypse is coming. It's already here for crying out loud. It's doom. It's danger. It's deadly. You got to read that. You got to read it aloud. You got to convince somebody that the apocalypse is at hand. The second coming is at hand. It's not going to be very good, folks. It's not going to be very good. It's coming. It's, it's right here. It's at hand. Uh, is that why you wrote plays? Because plays have to be done out loud. Whereas people sit and they read their poetry. Well, I, do, I don't see the poetry store. I don't go to Metro and there's a poetry section. I don't even hear people on the streets reciting poetry. I see people with guitars doing music. But where are the poets standing on the corners doing poetry? Oh, they that are. That would be my best world, right? Yeah. But how do we... But they are. They're standing in cafes. They're standing in bars. Sometimes they are standing on, on street corners reciting their poems. Sometimes they have a guitar and they're reciting their poems. Maybe that's what we should do. Maybe I should just go to the corner of Bathurst and Bloor and blast a poem. Please do.